about 34 years ago, uh, which is in my case just about to the day, half a lifetime ago, I made the rash decision of leaving Goldman Sachs to join a firm and a, and a man who was pretty anonymous at the time, um, although he wasn't a year later, Mike Milken uh, at Drexel in Los Angeles. I left New York and one of the very first people I met was Mike's closest childhood friend, confidant, advisor, and truly wonderful human beings of the planet, Richard Sandler. And it's a real honor today to, to interview Richard, who's written uh, an excellent book called Witness to the Prosecution, which we're gonna discuss today. I'd like to break this into three sections. First of all, um, because everybody has suddenly become a lot younger than I am, um, there are so many people out there who really don't know the history of the financial markets and the absolutely world-changing impact of what Mike Milken did. And I freely admit to bias on this issue, but I do believe, and I think there was a Business Week article in 1986 that said, Mike was the most important person in changing the financial market since J.P. Morgan. And I think it, it went even beyond that and has continued uh, to this day in providing the rocket fire for private equity for uh, many, many companies to finance. So we'll talk first about what Mike did before the prosecution. Then we'll talk a bit about the prosecution. And then we'll talk about the post-prosecution years. Um, with that, let me start, Richard, with a really simple question. Tell us a little bit about who Mike Milken is and, and why you even chose to write a book. Okay. So Mike, as you said, is someone I've known most of my life. I've had the pleasure of working with him uh, during the Drexel years and since. Uh, Mike's an extraordinary individual. He has a very, I, I call it, instead of using the word brilliant, facile mind. He has this ability to take in information, to store information, and then to use that information in ways that nobody else would to try to create something and make the world better. Um, so when he was in college, he studied the, he, he read a book on high yield securities. And he was fascinated by the fact that at looking at every single high yield security, now most of these securities were investment grade securities that had been downgraded because the companies got in trouble. And he learned that if you would invest across the board in these securities, they would pay off more than they didn't. You would make more money than the risk that you took. And that fascinated him. And that brought him to Wall Street, that got him involved in researching companies and trying to understand companies better. The reason I wrote the book is because he's one of the most misunderstood individuals, I believe, of our time. He's probably the most innovative and important financier of our time. I think people here would agree with that. I think you would agree with that, Josh. Um, he went through a very difficult period during the government investigation in the late 1980s. And that period has been described by others who have no knowledge in ways that are just not accurate. And since Mike has continued to be a public figure, I think it's important for the truth to be told, for people to understand what really happened to him, but also to understand that what happened to him could happen to any of us, to understand the process. So even for people that weren't born then or may not be that interested or you know what, what happened to Mike, though I think it's pretty interesting, I think they should understand how the process works and how it could happen to them. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about just what exactly Mike did that was so different. Because again, a lot of people here were either in elementary school or maybe not born at that time, um, unlike us, Richard. Um, Prior to 1979 or so, there literally was no such thing as a new issue high yield bond. Maybe talk a little bit about what that did to certain yep. industries in the US in terms of access to financing versus prior okay. abilities and accelerating the growth of certain major industries. So if it's okay, I'm gonna do that by just reading a couple passages of kind of why I wrote the book and then who Mike was and how he was looked at in the financial world. So this investigation started in 1986. From the moment the investigation started, I became Mike's personal lawyer, responsible for working with lawyers we hired and overseeing the defense. As such, I witnessed exactly what happened, how it happened, and why it happened. 
Michael Milken and this prosecution have been described in books and articles by others who had no firsthand knowledge of the events and were motivated to describe what happened in a certain way. I too am motivated to describe what happened, but I'm motivated because I want the true story told and I do have firsthand knowledge. I lived this matter day in and day out for over 10 years. Michael was a public figure then and is still a public figure in financial and philanthropic circles. It's important for history to reflect what happened and how it happened. One of the lawyers who led our defense was, was a lawyer named Arthur Lyman. Arthur was the principal partner of the Paul Weiss firm in New York, a very well-known lawyer at the time. Here's what Arthur had to say about Michael. Throughout my career, I've known and represented some powerful figures in the financial industries, but none like him, none so modest in how they lived or for whom money meant so little. None as committed as he was to his own visions and aspirations, an enigmatic figure to me even now, but I think I can say this about him. He was the most imaginative financier of his generation. He was also the least understood and the most demonized. And then going to your point, Stephen Moore, a former senior economist for the Congressional Joint Economic Committee, wrote the following in 2005, almost 20 years after the investigation started. For all the vilification of Michael Milken, his firm Drexel Burnham easily created more wealth for more American shareholders single-handedly than all the trust busters in American history. And Norman Barry, a professor of social and political theory at University of Buckingham, wrote in the Financial Times, in retrospect, most American economic observers say that Mr. Milken was good for the economy. His actions led to the breakup of conglomerates and the necessary reorganization of American business. His prosecution was more of a persecution. And finally, Alvin Toffler, the futurist and author of Future Shock. Milken made bitter enemies of two extremely powerful groups. One consisted of the old line Wall Street firms who previously had had a stranglehold on the flow of capital to American corporations. The other consisted of the top managers of many of the largest firms. Both had every reason to destroy him if they could. Both also had powerful allies in the government and the media. All these quotes and comments present a clear picture of why Michael Milken was an attractive target for an ambitious prosecutor, especially a politically ambitious one. Drexel Burnham Lambert created a new market that it dominated. It was financing individuals who never could get financing before and who could threaten the traditional clients of traditional firms. Mike Milken was a disruptor. Like many innovators and disruptors throughout history, he was bound to come under criticism at the time. So, so Richard, when I joined Drexel in 1984 from Goldman Sachs, uh, there had been a certain number of new issue high yield bonds that Mike had done, largely in, in industries where other firms refused to finance. For example, the gaming industry. Um, any, and this was a rapid growth, highly, highly popular, very profitable, easy way to print deals. Why was that handed to Drexel? Because these were regarded as sin bonds. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Solomon Brothers would not finance a gaming company. My job when I came in, uh, in capital markets, was to uh, recruit new clients to issue high yield, namely private equity firms, of which there were maybe, on a good day, two dozen firms, Clayton Dubalier, West Ray, uh, Adler and Shaken, KKR, yeah. et cetera. And I remember visiting with, with George Roberts and getting the Motel 6 deal, et cetera. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what happened to the, how, deals used to be financed before Mike, and then what happened, and what that meant for competitiveness and velocity, and what it did to the private equity business, which we all know now is, is, is a nine or $10 trillion in asset uh, business. So traditionally on Wall Street, you had the large firms financing large Fortune 500 companies. They would get investment grade ratings. Um, when Mike came along and started investing in high yield securities, he felt the most important thing that you could do in finance was research and understand what you were investing in. So you just wouldn't pick a name because it had been successful in the past. He would be looking to the future. 
This changed dramatically, I think, the way financing was done. And he would invest in companies after meeting the management, understanding the industry, understanding the company, the cash flow. Could this company pay the debt? As we all know, stocks and bonds are very different. Stocks, you could like a stock. I might not like the stock. The market doesn't like the stock. Company does well, and it trades at a very low PE, and it doesn't move up. A bond's a contract. If a company has the money to pay interest when interest is due and to pay principal, you'll get paid. If it doesn't, it won't get done. So when Mike started creating uh, more interest in high-yield securities and creating a market and trading it, it just became natural to do new issues of uh, high-yield securities for companies that had not been financed before. And as this became more and more successful, more and more firms on Wall Street would talk down about these high yield securities. I got a letter the other day from a friend of mine who had just read the book, who said he came to Kidder Peabody, and I'm not trying to put down any firm, but that's where he worked in the, in the mid 1980s, and they would talk about Drexel as a backwater firm, that they were involved in those high yield securities. It's something we wouldn't touch, it's beneath us, as the market kept growing and growing. Well, what happened was if you could finance entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs could find value in established companies, which had never been done before. And all of a sudden you had entrepreneurs going after public companies and those public companies were mad. Their investment bankers were mad. You know, a perfect example was Boone Pickens when he went after Unical. Union Oil of California, powerful company, had tremendous, uh, had tremendous interest in Congress, had tremendous allies in Congress, and Fred Hartley, I believe, was the president at the time, was furious that this guy, Boone Pickens, went after his company. He called Congress. Congress had, I can't tell you how many bills during that time, to either outlaw high-yield securities, limit tax deductibility of interest from high-yield securities, all these different things. So you had a total disruption of the business, and you had a you had a business and you had established firms in the business that were not happy about it. And, uh, you know, there, there was an interesting reaction, and Richard, I think, points it out well, uh, from the Wall Street firms themselves. Um, first, they didn't really understand this, so they wanted to say this was somehow bad. Then one of the top two firms, and I won't say which one it was, decided to go into the high yield business, but they really didn't understand how to do research on high yield type issuers. And the first three issuers they did didn't make the first interest payments. That would never have happened at Drexel, ever. Um, my former firm, I was trying to get Goldman to do stuff with us because um, they had great clients and they had management teams that wanted to do buyouts. We had relations with buyout firms. And finally, for the first time, we could compete against corporate acquirers because we could get private equity firms money quickly. Remember, prior to this, they would go and they would spend three months negotiating with equitable or prudential or teachers, and by the time they got the money in place, a public company would outbid them. Well, this was now speedy. So I tried to get uh, do deals with, with Goldman, and the first deal I came up with was a deal that didn't pass our credit committee. Mm. And I think they interpreted our rejection of the deal as somehow um, a deliberate slap in the face, so we never were able to do business together until many years later. But um, the, I think Richard's point is it, it did two things. Number one, it increased the velocity of private equity deals and therefore caused this huge proliferation of private equity funds which could now compete and finance and compete with other corporate acquirers. And the second thing it did was it allowed entrepreneurs, whether they were in a private equity firm or whether they were individuals, whether it was a Carl Icahn or a Boone Pickens or a Sam Heyman or a Nelson Peltz, or whether it was a private equity firm that maybe had a different idea of how those assets could be deployed and run more efficiently, this was extremely threatening to management teams that literally almost had almost no, no, no breaks, no, no governance limitations on how they ran their businesses. So, so you had two very powerful enemies. So let's go to the next yeah. phase, um, which is the prosecution. Um, you've now pissed off the business roundtable, you've pissed off Congress, you've pissed off um, establishment businesses, you've pissed off all of Wall Street. What happened? So here you had, Mike was also very media, I would call it media shy. He'd like to do his business, he didn't want to be in the spotlight, he didn't want to bring a lot of attention to himself, 
and he didn't have a lot of good relationships with his competitors on Wall Street for reasons that we've been talking about. He had a client, um, or a client of the firm, named Ivan Bosky. Ivan Bosky, for those that do not know, was the most revered risk arbitrageur of his time. He was literally the largest equity trader on the desk of every major firm right. on Wall Street that could get him to do business with them because he was a very large equity right. trader. So Mike would talk to him from time to time. They even did a financing for him. I think Mike's view was maybe he would become a bond buyer at some point, though that never really happened. Um, and it turned out one day in November of 1986 that it came across a tape as the market closed on a Friday afternoon that Ivan Bosky, this person that everybody did business with and thought was, did such a great job, was involved in insider trading, was going to plead guilty to at least one felony, was going to cooperate with the government, governor, government and was going to pay a $100 million fine, which was a huge, huge amount at that time. And it shook up Wall Street. At the same time it came across the tape, I was in my office, in the same office where you were, um, Josh, and I got a phone call that there were federal marshals downstairs serving subpoenas on Michael Milken, Lowell Milken, and others. Same thing was happening at New York at the Drexel offices. Got to understand, none of us ever dreamed that we would ever be in a position where the United States government would be doing a criminal investigation of what we were doing. Um, it kind of rocked us at the time. We had no idea what we were going to face or how what we were going to face it for the next 10 years. So to give an idea of what prosecution is supposed to be like versus what it is like, let me just read a couple other things uh, from the book. There was a case called uh, Berger versus United States, United States Supreme Court case, in which the Supreme Court said, describing the job of a prosecutor, a United States attorney, the United States attorney is a representative not of an ordinary party to a controversy, but of a sovereign whose obligation to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all, and whose interest, therefore, in a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win a case, but that justice shall be done. Then, uh, years, uh, a, a, um, a former attorney general named Bob Jackson address some U.S. attorneys. And he described the job of a prosecutor to these young prosecutors. The prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any person in America. His discretion is tremendous. He can have citizens investigated. And if he's that kind of person, he can have this done to the tune of public statements and veiled and unveiled intimidations. The prosecutor can order arrests, present cases to the grand jury in secret session, and on the basis of his one-sided presentation of facts can cause a citizen to be indicted and held for trial. If a prosecutor is obliged to choose his cases, it follows he can choose his defendant. Therein is the most dangerous power of the prosecutor, that he will pick people that he thinks he should get rather than pick cases that need to be prosecuted. With the law books filled with a great assortment of crimes, a prosecutor stands a fair chance of finding at least a technical violation of some act on the part of almost anyone. The prosecutor in our case, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York at the time, was a guy named Rudolph Giuliani. Uh, the Edward Bennett Williams, who was probably one of the great defense lawyers of our time, who passed away, unfortunately, in 1988, initially was representing us. And when I talked to him the first time, he said, Rudolph Giuliani is the biggest piece of political meat I have seen since Tom Dewey. Tom Dewey was a U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, as was Giuliani, who went on to become governor of New York and almost president of the United States. It was known that Rudy Giuliani at the time had political ambitions. He did go on to be mayor of New York and I think tried to be uh, president of the United States, didn't get very far in doing it. So, now, I just told you what a prosecutor's job is supposed to be and the power they have. Here is the prosecutor in our case, the line prosecutor, John Carroll, who was gracious enough to come to a class I taught at Stanford Law School, talked about how he viewed his job at the time, how he was trained as a prosecutor. The criminal justice system is basically an exercise in raw power. I probably didn't understand it when I was a prosecutor. I certainly understand it now. It is very much an uneven game where the government has enormous power. 
exercised by very young and very inexperienced people. A good prosecutor has to be energetic, black and white, zealous, ambitious, personally ambitious, because that's what drives the engine. Sort of a different description than the Attorney General Robert Jackson gave of a prosecutor's job. Richard, I, I just want to intercede. There was an obituary in the New York Times the day before yesterday for Harry Connick Sr., uh, the father of the famous musician. And Harry Connick Sr. was a prosecutor, actually a, a district attorney. So he, was, he had the same you know, um, responsibility to seek justice as opposed to um, zealously prosecute. Yet he had a reputation for being a highly, highly overzealous prosecutor who um, exercised his, uh, the power of his position to prosecute dozens and dozens of poor black uh, males who later on were found out not to be guilty. But the power is extremely asymmetric when you're in that seat. And it doesn't matter if you're Mike Milken at the peak or if you're a poor black man um, arrested for some, for some uh, alleged crime. Um, it's, it's a very, very unfair fight. Um, to amplify Richard's point about how prosecutors see their role in real life versus what their actual responsibilities should be as stewards of the government and seeking justice. Um, there was also, in parallel to the criminal trial, there was a civil case seeking hundreds of millions of damages, uh, dollars of damages uh, from Drexel and from Drexel affiliated entities. And what the SEC did, in my opinion, was absolutely alarming and shocking to me, which is they hired the law firm of Milberg, Weiss, Burchad um, to represent them. Milberg, Weiss is a strike suit firm. They're like, it's like hiring an ambulance chaser. They get a percentage of the dollars they recover. They have no interest whatsoever in pursuing the truth. They have one interest and one interest only, which is extracting maximum amount of damages. And they have a reputation, or had a reputation before the principals of the firm all went to jail, uh, for lying, cheating, and stealing in pursuit of cases. Um, this is what we were up against. It was alarming. I was a young kid at the time, and I do recall a deposition with the US Attorney's uh, Office where they were going through my notes like this, and because and the, they had taken all of our notes, and they saw a list of corporate raiders, and it was Ron Perlman, Ivan Boski, uh, Sam Heyman, Nelson Peltz, and, and, and at the bottom it said, IB fee. And so they thought this must be some uh, nefarious payment to Ivan Boski. And they said, what's this list? And I said, That's, those are my notes on who is going to be speaking at the High Yield Conference this year. And it was like a kind of a bust for them. And the IB fee referred to just investment banking fee on some unrelated transaction. If they just turned the page, they could see exactly what it was. But this was the, this was the atmosphere as they were seeking any aha moment that they could seek. So it was a pretty tough um, environment and one that was very unforgiving and very stacked. Yeah. Um, it was very a difficult time. And I think in the couple minutes we have left, I just want to leave you with, you know, what I do describe in the book and why, to me, it's an important story is we had to deal with those kind of prosecutors. We had to deal with that kind of power. Mike Milken was 40 years old when this started. You talk about being a young kid, okay? I was 38 years old when this thing started. Um, and they wore us down. They got people to become government witnesses. They got people to turn. They put, uh, they leaked things to the media. We describe it all there to the point where Mike at some point said, you know what, I got to figure out a way to cut my risk, okay? My family, I got young kids. I can't put myself in the point where I have this huge risk. Plus, my brother has been indicted with me. And as John Carroll admitted to me at the class, his brother was indicted solely to put pressure on him. This was a Giuliani way that he did business is basically getting more and more leverage on the people. So we went through this whole process. Eventually we pled. I describe in detail what Mike pled and didn't plead to. Everything he pled to was a regulatory violation, none of which had ever been prosecuted as a criminal violation before, most of which I don't believe had even been, uh, had even been prosecuted as a civil matter before by the SEC. 
These were very unusual things. You can read about them. But he made a decision for his interests and his family's interests that he would settle the case as long as he did not have to admit to anything he didn't do, uh, which is what happened. The most incredible thing about Mike is when this was over, I can't even tell you, hopefully this gives you some idea how painful this was. He got up, dusted himself off without bitterness and decided that he was gonna get up every morning and continue trying to make the world a better place. And that's what he has done. I think it's a story that's important to be told, not just because of one individual, but how a system works. People are going through that system today. Most people, 99% of the people that go through the system do not have the resources or the relationships that Michael Milken had. And I think it's important that we all understand how that system works. So, so Richard, we talked about this incredible impact uh, prior to any of the prosecution, which today really defines the way capital markets work. Private equity is enormous. Um, private markets exceed public markets in size. Um, high yield financing, private credit, these are all things that would not have been possible unless someone else had come up with a lot of the things that Mike had done. And, and once in a lifetime, you're lucky enough to meet somebody who's that impactful. Um, just talk for one second about some of the specific things that Mike's focused on post the prosecution and in it, after he dusted himself off. Having the ability not to just jump into a hole and hide, and, but to be positive and optimistic and continue to have impact is, is really, to me, an extraordinary quality so, of Mike's. So in 1982, four years before this even started, Mike and his brother started the Milken Family Foundation to institutionalize their philanthropic work. And they focus on public education and medical research. And Mike picked that up, okay? He was already doing it. He continued to do it. Milken Family Foundation gives awards of $25,000 to public school teachers every year. Uh, next year, they will give their 3,000th award since this program started. What Mike has done in medical research on the, for, on the uh, cover of Fortune magazine, it calls him the man who changed medicine. Millions of people are walking around, especially men with prostate cancer today, who may not have been alive if they hadn't done the work they've done. The Milken Institute is focused on how do we make life better for people by creating capital available to entrepreneurs, job creation, people to lead meaningful lives. It probably, next to this conference, or maybe uncomparable to this conference, it has a global conference every year uh, in Los Angeles. Some of you may have attended it where it brings together people from government, from business, from health, from education, to talk about what are the world's problems, how do we solve the problems, how do we use entrepreneurship and the capitalistic system to do that. And that's what Mike still does 16 to 18 hours a day, each and every day. Thank you very much, Richard. I encourage you all to buy witness for the, to the prosecution. Send it to your friends. It's a great Christmas gift. Thank you. Thank you.